thank you for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our webinar Wednesday program. We are coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They are recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 400 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions. So if you have questions from our, for our speaker, we will have her information on the last slide of the presentation today. A special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition for making these webinars possible. The NVSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. Okay, and now a little bit about us. We work with US federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. More information is on our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 20,800 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for pricing information with the email shown on the screen. Okay, now to introduce our speaker, Katie Gentek. Welcome, Katie. We are glad to have you here with us today, and I'll now turn the floor over to you. Thank you, Hunter. Um, hi, everybody. Um, glad to be here today. Um, so I guess we can move on to the, the title page of the presentation. Um, and this is going to be focused today on compliance checklists for new federal contractors. And we can move on to the next slide. So quick overview of what this checklist is that I put together. Um, what I'm focusing on today uh, are points that cover um, the importance of having corporate policies, uh, procedures, uh, clear-cut roles and responsibilities, and I'm also going to touch on a couple uh, a couple points on regulations, uh, cost principles, and competition and subcontracting. Um, a little background as to why I put this particular checklist together. Um, these are more uh, high-level discussion points regarding compliance um, as opposed to, say, putting together a checklist to comply with individual regulations. And the reason I did that is uh, the regulations that are going to apply to you are going to be dependent on a variety of things, such as your contract mechanism, uh, the price, who your agency is that you're working with. So to put together an all-inclusive, you know, regulatory compliance checklist just wouldn't really work for our purposes today. So what I'm trying to focus on here is to give you more of a, a big picture framework uh, within which you can operate and thus ensure compliance. Um, compliance comes more as a result, not just of knowing the regulations that pertain to your contract, but in having the proper policies, procedures, and team structures in place so you can proactively manage your contract. Otherwise, you'd be operating in more of a, a reactive manner and Reactivity can uh, result in um, missed approval requirements or deliverable deadlines, and um, that can lead to things such as government disallowances of specific costs, which can affect your bottom line, and it can also uh, negatively impact your reputation as a responsible contractor. So with that said, I think we can move on to the next slide. So the first checklist item I had here was um, identifying internal individuals and teams and their responsibilities. Um, this is important uh, because it gives you, again, that framework in which your team is working. And the more clear-cut your roles and responsibilities are, the more certain you are to make sure you're not overlooking uh, contract terms and conditions. Um, so why, why is uh, this important anyway? Um, in the U.S. government contracting world, as opposed to the commercial contracting world, which I'm assuming uh, most listeners are coming from, uh, the stakes are really raised here in terms of risk to your company. Um, in the commercial world, as a, a seller of goods or services, um, there's more flexibility in terms of negotiating terms and conditions. Oftentimes, the seller can really drive what those terms and conditions are going to be, 
Um, but in the case of U.S. government contracting, it's the government or the buyer who's, who's driving those terms and conditions. And in a lot of cases, most cases are non-negotiable. Um, so in this way, uh, the stakes are raised for you. So having these clear-cut roles and responsibilities are going to allow you to, uh, to ensure proactive management. Um, so walking through what these, uh, these uh, team roles look like, uh, you're going to have your technical experts, the people who are implementing the scope of work. Um, you're going to have a project management team. And these are the people who are making sure that uh, the work is happening on time, uh, within budget, and who are also going to be maintaining your project files. And this is another piece that might differ from the commercial contracting world. Uh, you want to make sure you're documenting uh, decisions that are being made, um, any communications that you're having with your clients. Uh, you're kind of papering everything to make sure that if there are disputes that come up or if you end up being audited down the line by the government, um, you have everything covered in your files. Um, the project management team is also uh, going to be the point of contact with your uh, contracting officer's representative or the core. And the core is the person who, who manages uh, the technical implementation of the contract as well as the budget. Then you're going to have your contract management team. Um, these are the people who are hopefully going to have familiarity with the regulations. Um, who can make sure that you are operating compliantly, that you're not missing approval requirements that are in your contract, um, that can bring to light any regulatory requirements that the project management team might not be aware of or the technical team might not be aware of. And this is the team who is going to be the point of contact with the, uh, the U.S. government contracting officer. Um, last here I have is the accountant. And this is the person who's going to be uh, putting together your invoices, going to be um, making sure that costs are accounted for properly within your internal accounting system. And then I have a bullet here on regular and transparent communications. And I wanted to include this here. This is important. Um, again, going back to that point on being proactive. Uh, in my experience, if I've worked on teams where all of these individuals are not in regular communication with each other about what's happening on the contract, um, that can create risk of non-compliance. Um, as someone who's been both in project management and contract management, um, if a contract person isn't apprised of what's going on, um, oftentimes that can lead to, to risk of non-compliance. Um, let's see. I think we can move on to the next slide. Okay. Contract approvals matrix. So this is um, what I consider a best practice um, in my years of doing this. Uh, when you first get a new contract, I recommend um, putting together a matrix which requires you to read through your contract in great detail and make note of anywhere in the contract that you see that you may need to have a client approval, whether it's an approval by the core or the CO. Um, you could also do this for any required deliverables and their due dates and what they need to contain. Um, and essentially what this is going to look like, it's going to lay out every clause that has one of these approval or notification requirements and uh, cite where in the contract it can be found, and if applicable, if there's a FAR or a DFAR or an ADAR, whatever uh, supplemental agency regulation there might be, um, include that citation and note what the required action is um, or any due dates, or if you need to give, you know, request this approval a certain number of days in advance of taking, taking action. Um, and note who internally is going to be responsible for that. As I mentioned before, your, your project management team is likely going to be the, the point of contact with the core, and your contract management team will likely be the point of contact with the CEO. Um, and I just find this is a great kind of cheat sheet that you'll have on hand. So when it comes time to implement the contract, uh, you can keep this close by and kind of get familiar with what all of those potential approvals and notifications are going to look like. And again, that comes back to the, the proactivity piece here, that if you can keep ahead of the game and 
know what approvals or notifications are going to be required, um, you can make sure you're not missing those marks. Um, because in my experience, if you miss uh, if you miss that and you ask for an approval retroactively, that can result in a disallowance. Um, next slide. Okay, contractor policies. Um, there are quite a few cases within the regulations that are going to require you to rely on your own corporate policies. And having these policies in place uh, reassures the government that you're a responsible entity and that you can carry out the work efficiently and compliantly and consistently. Uh, and that's key here. If you have a policy in place, you need to make sure that you're applying it consistently across your work. Um, policies that are written uh, must be within the bounds of the regulations. Um, and what I mean by that, uh, as an example, let's say uh, you have an internal process or policy for uh, procuring goods and services. Um, if it comes time for you to procure a good or a service under your contract, um, there are cases where you're going to need to get uh, CO consent uh, before you actually um, put a, a subcontract or a purchase order in place. So if you already have policies in place for procurement processes, uh, you're probably going to need to tweak those uh, to make sure that you're accounting for any specific requirements in your contract, such as CO consent. Um, there may also be cases uh, that you have to develop new policies. One in particular, if you have a contract that's uh, valued at $5.5 million or higher, and uh, the period of performance is at least 120 days, you're going to be required to have a written code of business ethics and conduct in place. Um, so these are the sorts of things you need to be keeping an eye out for per the regulatory requirements and what those um, policies are going to look like. Um, when you have these policies in place, you must enforce them corporately. Uh, you need to make sure you have high-level buy-in uh, at the executive level team to enforce these across the board. Um, and if, if there are inconsistencies in how you apply these policies, that can, uh, you can be dinged for that in an audit, and that can lead to disallowances. Um, if you have to make exceptions to policies, then you want to make sure you're writing up justifications um, for those exceptions and saving those justifications to the project file. Uh, next slide. Um, so those were points on uh, corporate corporate pieces that you can uh, take into account. And now I want to touch on um, some of the regulatory requirements that are more high level requirements. Um, probably the most important being the cost principles. Um, so cost principles, they're, they're laid out in the Federal Acquisition Regulation, the FAR, in Part 31. And these cost principles are used to uh, negotiate pricing for contracts and any contract modifications. And they're used uh, by the government to determine if a cost that you're requesting reimbursement for in an invoice uh, should be paid by the government. Um, the cost principles will differ depending on what type of business entity you are. There's cost principles for for-profit, uh, cost principles for nonprofit, and for educational institutions as well. And those are all laid out in, in Part 31. Um, and essentially, the essence of the cost principles are to determine um, what costs are considered allowable. And what that means is uh, if the cost is allowable, it means the government will pay it. If it's a cost the government won't pay, it's an, an unallowable cost. And how you define allowability uh, comes down to a few factors, um, including allocability, which means the cost is uh, incurred specifically for your contract um, to carry out that contract. It's not an overhead cost. It's not, you know, your office rent. Um, it's a cost that you incur specifically for that contract. Um, the cost also has to be considered reasonable, and uh, what that means essentially is uh, is the price of the cost of the item that you're or uh, service or whatever it is that you're billing to the contract um, is it a cost that a prudent person would incur? 
Um, so an example I often give for this, and it's kind of an extreme example, but hopefully it gets the point across. Um, let's say you have to purchase a vehicle for your, under your contract. Um, is it more reasonable to purchase uh, a Chevy Malibu or a Lamborghini? Obviously, though, the answer is going to be a Chevy Malibu is priced more reasonably. So this is really just to make sure that uh, excessive costs are avoided under the contract. Um, there are also specific uh, limitations on cost categories laid out in Part 31. Uh, so any cost also has to be compliant with those. Um, for example, uh, there's cost, cost discussing alcohol. Alcohol is always unallowable. You could never bill alcohol to the contract. Um, and then any costs incurred have to be uh, compliant with GAAP, uh, generally accepted accounting practices. So all of these things in combination determine whether or not a cost is considered allowable. Um, when the question of allowable costs comes into play are going to be when you're negotiating a budget with the, with the, uh, the government. Um, if you have to submit an itemized detailed budget, um, they're likely going to look at every, every one of those cost line items that you present, and you need to be able to show that those costs are allowable. Uh, this will also apply um, if you are awarded a reimbursable contract, such as um, cost plus fixed fee or time and materials. Um, any costs that you include in your invoices to the government um, must be allowable costs. Um, so anything that's deemed unallowable or even just not allocable to your contract will be disallowed and you'll be required to cover that cost uh, out of your bottom line. Uh, the cost principles not only apply to uh, any direct costs or directly allocable costs to the contract, but if you are also requesting reimbursement um, for any indirect costs, whether you charge a, a percentage on top of all costs or you prorate and uh, direct bill for a prorated amount of indirect costs, um, those indirect costs must be compliant with the cost principles as well. Uh, cost principles also require that you apply consistent, consistent accounting practices across all lines of your work, whether, whether it's government related or not. So the, the key takeaway here is uh, compliance with the cost principles is a must and non-compliance would result in disallowances and therefore loss to the company. Uh, next slide. Um, competition and subcontracting. I wanted to pull this one up uh, as well. Um, in my experience, subcontracting is all, always comes up under prime contracts. Um, that may not be the case for everyone on the call, but it's pretty common. And to get clear on, first of all, what the definition of subcontracting is, um, one might think that it means you're subbing out a portion of the scope of work, so it's technical in nature. Um, but the FAR actually uh, has a much broader definition of what a subcontract is. And it basically, if you're procuring anything under your contract, um, it's considered a subcontract. And when you procure any goods or services under your contract, uh, there's a FAR clause you're likely going to see in your contract, FAR 52.244-5, which requires that you compete uh, any subcontracts are going to issue to the maximum practical extent. And that's uh, kind of a gray phrase, um, what is practical, and that's kind of up to interpretation. And this is, again, where it becomes important to have specific policies and procedures in place. Um, oftentimes, uh, companies will mirror the government. The government uh, only has required competition for anything over the micro purchase threshold, which is $10,000 currently. So you may mirror that to determine when you need to uh, compete for purchasing a good or a service. Um, but whatever, however that's defined uh, within your policy, if you do not compete, you have to be able to adequately justify why you haven't competed. And um, typical justifications that I've seen are uh, there's a sense of urgency, um, maybe this requirement just came up 
fairly quickly and in order to meet contract objectives or deliverables, you don't have time to go through developing an RFP and evaluating offers. Um, so there's a sense of urgency associated with it. Or perhaps um, through your own market research, you've identified that there's only one, one company out there who can provide whatever it is that you're purchasing, and that's called a sole source acquisition. Um, so what exactly does competition mean? Um, Again, that's it's not defined in this FAR clause, but through through my experience, it's um, pretty good practice to actually, instead of just calling it competition, um, use the FAR definition for what's called adequate price competition. And I've put the citation here if you want to look it up. It's a fairly lengthy definition, um, but in essence, it means that you're looking to acquire at least uh, two to three quotes from independent uh, offers uh, and um, award to, to the best value. Um, as I mentioned previously, uh, you want to make sure you have clear-cut procurement policies and procedures in place to make sure you're meeting these competition requirements. Um, and again, any um, deviation from your competition policy, uh, you would need to adequately justify in writing and save to the project files. Um, so I think that uh, that covers it. That's our last slide. So I'll turn it back over to Hunter. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you, Katie, for your great presentation and your time. Um, the recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us this Friday as we cover each part of the FAR and join us next Wednesday for more hot topics in federal contracting. Thanks, Hunter.